What is the best book you've ever read? Verity by Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Colleen Hoover. Let's talk about Colleen Hoover books. Imagine selling more copies than the Bible. This is Colleen Hoover, and her fans are religiously devoted. She writes romance, paranormal romance, YA, she writes thrillers, she writes psychological thrillers. As she puts it herself, I don't like to be confined to one genre. If you put me in a box, I'll claw my way out. There's no middle ground with Colleen Hoover. You either love her or you hate her. But will Colleen convert me into the Colleen cult? I'm gonna read every single Colleen Hoover book. And to start off in the spirit of love and hate, what better way than to get to know an author than by reading their best and their very worst. Starting off on a high note, the second best reviewed book at 4.32 stars with a 83.69% positive score, the romantic thriller Verity. This is the book that makes people question, why read Verity when you can just pull out a Ouija board and summon the demon for life? I finished this book feeling completely sapped of life, as if I've been bleeding freely for the past few hours. 5 stars. So unique, so completely shocking that it blows away every other suspense story I've ever read. And a book that permanently alters the way that this reviewer looks at a steak and shake. What's the American casual restaurant chain concentrated primarily in the Midwestern United States got to do with Colin Hoover? Colleen wants us to feel like this is giving horror movie thriller when really it's just giving ableism. <laughs> More on that in a bit. We start off the book with a blood, a car crash, and a man taking off his shirt. Imagine being a writer. Your mother passed away the week before and you hate yourself because you think you're so plain. This is the first time you've been out in weeks and you're trying to get to a very important meaning when OH GOSH DARN IT YOU'VE GOT SPILLS ALL OVER YOUR TOP Except it isn't coffee. It's blood. It's the splatters of a man who's been crushed by a car. And a passing random stranger man drags you into the bathroom and he offers you the shirt off his very back. There's a part of him that doesn't want anyone to notice. He wants to be invisible in the city. And you notice that because you are share like Holmes. And he's like, <laughs> I've seen worse. What? Well, I saw my eight year old daughter's body getting pulled out of a lake and you think, shit, I should not have asked. Anyway, that man needs to run. He's late for a meeting and you are too. You get to the building and oh, the same man that you met is in the building where your meeting is. <laughs> he's going up to the same floor that you're meant to go to. The man is in your meeting. The man is Jeremy. He's just a man. And his famous author wife Verity has also been in a car crash and now she's in a catatonic state. She has carers that look after her and she has one son left alive. Remember the eight year old body who got out there? Yeah, that's her daughter. And she needs someone to write the rest of her books. That somebody? is you. So you stay at their home for a few days to gather materials. You know, how am I gonna finish this series, right? But in the process of doing that, oh! you find her autobiography and so you're like oh, i'm a bit snaky snaky let me <laughs> have a peek and that is the worst decision that you ever made in your life because you discover some deeply twisted secrets there is no light where we are going this is your final warning darkness ahead oh, oh also that man who scolded that got crushed yeah he's never mentioned again <laughs> Verity's autobiography, which is basically just hours of smut. Chapter 1's basically like, oh, this is the first time that I met my husband, Jeremy. Okay, this is edited over here. I just want to read to you a passage, so I would play it for you, but I'm scared about copyright. So let me just reenact. The way that the voice actor portrays this is like this, yeah? He stared at me with a tilted head and a crooked smile. You've had three drinks in 45 minutes. I'd much rather you make that choice while you're sober. His voice sounded like it was coated in honey. Honey? Okay, I'm not sure about honey. Maybe Lynx Africa. Because it was kind of giving like prepubescent 13 year old boy was trying to buy tickets for an R rated movie. I love it when I'm trying to listen to an audiobook and they're giving each character a distinctive voice. And for the men, they're always like, whoa, you're so hot. <laughs> He's like, you know what? Let me treat my girl. And then he shakes her steak at a uh, steak and shake. So. Just for this video, I spent over 35 hours listening to Colleen Hoover's audiobooks.
And I'm so glad I had my status between three A and C's headphones to do that. Who have been kind enough to sponsor this video. These headphones are comfortable and they're so sleekly designed. They last up to 12 hours without you having to charge them. They have both ambient sound and noise cancellation. The noise cancellation is the best noise cancellation that I've tried personally. I was like, I want to hear this audiobook in 4K and I can customize my own EQ using the status app. It's around 100 pounds cheaper than my Sony's. And with the triple driver system, it's just as juicy. Status and I have partnered to give my audience you guys a promotional discount you can hear these beats as well using the code it's divya at checkout using my link in the description if you want a discount make sure to check them out these sound really good we understand now the review everything seems to be going well very change i mean but then she gets pregnant lo and finds out that verity really doesn't want children because one she's jealous of the attention that her man is not giving the child and two she really doesn't want her body to change the way the book writes this it's like she is so evil she is the and then when the baby's born, kind of looks at the child in disgust. And she thinks, wow, my man sucked on these honkers. Ugh. We find out she has twins and she feels no love for them. Now, postpartum depression is a thing. And I think Verity firstly should not have had a child. But now that she has, she very clearly needs help. Verity's whole shtick is A, fuck them kids. And B, when will me and my husband born again? This is editor Divya again. Okay, so I just wanted to know that this was like four hours of him talking about his ding dong schlong and how much she loves it. And it was just like, she gets engaged boing king. She's always writing about how they're boing. She was thinking about when's the next time they're boing, how long have they boinged, why the kids won't let them boing. And it's like, they make these important life decisions just when they're boing. And it's like, at this point, make a shrine. Anyway, that's all I had to say. <coughs> over and out <coughs> and so Lowen's reading this and in between all this reading of the smart we need to have a bit of plot point Lowen keeps thinking that there is something paranormal and suspicious going around the house firstly she keeps thinking that she sees the curtains moving she keeps thinking that Verity is staring at her even though she shouldn't be able to she sees the remaining kid that's alive talking to her mom and she's like what's going on and there's even a point where she wakes up in Verity's bed basically all to insinuate that Verity is faking her disability. This is all set up for us to hate Verity, right? Find out some deeply twisted shit about how Verity has been treating the kids, how deep her jealousy runs, and the mystery behind her kid's death and Verity's accident. While Lowen is reading all this and she's falling in love with Jeremy, who is Myra, mind you just a man. Because she's like, wow, he cares about his kids. That's so amazing. The bar is in hell. Lowen feels so sorry for Jeremy that she has a wife who is disabled now. Saying that Jeremy has to, quote, care for an eggshell with no yolk. She's pondering, uh, do I need to tell him about this wife, this manuscript that I've uncovered? Do I leave it? But, you know, he's already so distraught. I don't know if this book was trying to be Jane Eyre with all the mental issues wife gets locked up attic storyline like colleen wants us to feel like this is giving horror movie thriller when really it's just giving ableism lowen is just scared of a disabled woman i don't like to be confined to one genre if you put me in a box i'll claw my way out you come to find out that she's rightfully scared but even in the beginning the way lowen treats verity is just basically treating her like she's not a human it's just annoying because it's like why are you saying oh of course she's disabled of course she's faking it <laughs> Psychological thriller. But can we talk about how messed up the MC is as well? Firstly, slut shaming. There's like this quote where the MC thinks that like anything besides vanilla in your early 20s uh, is sexual perversion. Yeah. And I'm not talking about ice cream flavors. And there's this part where you learn that when Verity and Jeremy were doing some woohoo action, Verity used to bite down on the headboard and Lowen gets all worked up reading these scenes and she's like, let me let me do a bit of role play recreation. Um and she also bites down on the exact same bite mark. <coughs> now I'm getting really aggressive guys. Now it's getting really aggressive, guys. If someone's munching on corn in the cob, I'm not gonna then go ahead and munch on the same corn. You know what I mean? Like, right. MC herself was starting to get a little bit obsessed with Jeremy, who is just a man. And then there's writing. Millennial Tumblr call. There's a nonsense scene where Jeremy and Lowen are in the grocery store. He's surrounded by these two blondes. One of them is named Patricia and they're gossiping. <laughs> of course, they both love Jeremy and of course, MC is jealous. And then when they say bye, Jeremy says to Patricia, oh, give my best to Sherman. 
And then Patricia goes, my husband's name is William. Who is P. Sherman 42 Wallaby Way Sydney? Uh, Lohan asks. Jeremy goes, he's the guy, the guy she behind her husband's back. And then MC says, I've never seen that kind of epic burn in person. There would be no epic karmic moments like the one I just witnessed. Epic burn. When was this released again? Yeah, you told Patricia Jeremy. And then next two pages, Jeremy goes and cheats on his disabled wife and has an affair with MC. <laughs> Smells like a hypocrite. Ultimately, of course, I want to have a girlfriend and a wife. There's a part where she tells Jeremy, you smell like petrichor. Okay, Tom. There's a lot of, let's call it spicy scenes. And some of them are like the funniest scenes that I've ever read. What I want, you. He pushes off the counter and marches towards me. <coughs> I'm scared. <laughs> what do you mean marches? Like he's like, he's like, hot, two, three, four. Uh, maybe the worst part of all this one, he asked her, what's the first street that you lived in? Um, What's your pet's first name? And her first thought is, oh, isn't that like how you get your star name? Isn't that how you steal people's identity and you hack into their accounts? Like, mm, I think Sherlock Holmes needs a little bit of digital training. I reckon people read this twice, Sarah, because there's a massive plot twist at the end when really it's just a plot hole if you think about it for more than two seconds. Anyone who has seen any sort of true crime investigation knows that what happens at the end, they would never get away with it because there is DNA everywhere. I also feel like this whole twist could have been solved with a simple conversation just like a hey um you wrote this what's up with that i don't know get a variety to talk a little bit hey baby shark on repeat she was bound to stir up okay spoiler bit uh, if you don't want to know like uh, it'll be gone when everything okay so the ending is like oh verity yeah. is oh she's this evil woman she killed her kids so lowen is like jeremy you have to read her manuscript and J jeremy's like i'm so angry I need to kill her. Even though he already tried to kill her twice before because he kind of read the manuscript already, but only the first bit. And then he's like, I need to kill her again for the third time. Firstly, doesn't he choke her? Wouldn't his fingerprint marks be there? Secondly, if she's trying to vomit on her own thing, did he not shove his hand down her throat? And would his DNA not be there as well? Okay. And then Verity wrote a letter saying, oh, actually, like, the whole thing that I wrote, I was, it's opposite day. I was lying about everything because it was a writing exercise. Um, so if it, that was a writing exercise, do you actually hate your husband? Like, how much opposite are we talking? I mean, the whole point of that is to find out, was she lying? Was she not lying? And I think either way, it doesn't make sense. Uh, if she was lying, again, simple conversation could have been solved. Could have sent him a text message. Like, I'm sure there's periods where he's out at work when you can send him a text message. You can leave the house. Secondly, if she was, she was just like, trying to do a gotcha. Again, just run away, send a text message. Like, you, you do not have to be doing all of that. So I will never look at a steak and shake the same way. True. I do feel completely sap from life. It literally blows away from every other suspense story ever. I don't understand how this book has 1.5 million five-star ratings. If this is second best, I don't know where best is going. For Colin Hoover's very best book ever, with a 4.39 stars, with 86.17% of all reviews being positive, reminders of him. This is a book which Colleen Hoover put her whole Khaleesi into. A book that reportedly makes you ugly cry at 2am. Queen of the emotional read. We start off the book with vehicular manslaughter again, but this time is actually important to the plot. The background, MC is basically like, I crashed my car and left you to bleed. I still care. I loved you. Imagine you've been released from prison. You're making your way downtown, driving fast, faces pass, and you're homebound. You're staring blankly ahead. You want to find a five-year-old daughter who doesn't know who you are, making your way into a bookstore that's not a bar, making my way through that crowd. And I need you, bartender who thinks that she's hot. Staring at her thinking, why is this sad woman drinking coffee by herself? Hey you, come back tomorrow night. We got tension. You're kind of hot and tomorrow we will make out in the booth. And in the middle of making out, you're going to realize, oh shit, I know this man. This man is my dead husband's best friend. 
Uh, but I really like making out and I'm not gonna tell it. By the way, this best friend has kind of an assumed uncle role for that daughter that you're trying to find. Um, and I miss you, my dead husband ex. And now I wonder if the grandparents are gonna let me see my child. The stars align with crazy coincidence again. Okay, let's recap. Hey, she's killed her husband accidentally um, by getting accidentally plastered drunk and accidentally getting behind the wheel and accidentally crying the car and accidentally letting your husband out to bleed and not calling the ambulance for over six hours because you think he's dead but it's just a mistake the way she was pregnant she gives birth to a child um and the grandparents are like yeah fuck you we're taking the kids and she's come back to her old town she's trying to rekindle the relationship with her daughter but ends up rekindling the relationship with her dead husband's best friend she must be breaking the bro code or the girl code or She's breaking some kind of code. Romance books always tend to serve the reader's fantasies. It's, it's a romance book. You want a little bit of fantasy. Something that wouldn't happen in real life. Colleen Hoover's books are just so... It's just so instant love. Here's a quote. Her face is a work of art. I wish there was a picture of it hanging on a wall in a museum somewhere so I could stand in front of it and stare at it for as long as I want. And you think, oh my god, that's so hot. <laughs> Imagine the same quote, but now he's ugly. Her face is a work of art. I wish there was a picture of it hanging on a wall in a museum somewhere so I could stand in front of it and stare at it for as long as I want. Beautiful descriptions, for example, uh, from Kenna MC's point of view. He's more tempting than any bougie coffee. There's a war in his eyes and I am by no means Switzerland. What? There's other plot points in this novel. For example, she writes these letters to her dead husband and there's this weird moment where right after her and the dead husband's best friend inevitably, you know, worlds collide directly afterwards she writes a letter to her dead husband going that was kind of great i miss you but i think that my goodreads status update sums this up best um i'm so bored i've genuinely never been so bored before it's so boring nothing is happening i'm bored out of my mind the text is so boring the characters are so boring the plot so far is so minimal tension just so boring i'm so entirely bored you know how sometimes rice is a vehicle for curry it feels like the supposed plot is just a vehicle for banging fuck sex ass piece of shit that's how you grab attention with verbal words the main message of this book was like you know everyone deserves a second chance you know you need to give everyone the benefit of the doubt and like from the jump i felt no sympathy for her a six hour stun lock really also are there no legal routes to seeing your child not even a phone call not even a hey can we talk this out like adults you're really just gonna stalk your child befriend people close to your child so you can get close to your child and then just show up at their house <laughs> back to prison for you i think everybody has this troubled backstory but she doesn't really do much with it it's kind of like maybe this is what jacqueline wilson's books would be like except if they were for adults and except if they were shit he tilts my face and directs my focus back to his. Kenna, don't. Please. Let's just see what happens. I'm a fucking mess right now because I'm gonna miss him so, so much. Our foreheads meet. It looks like he's struggling to keep his composure. I'm sorry, I could <coughs> do more for you. Wait. You need this. You're so close to your free snow cone. I'm so angry at them, Kenna. This isn't fair. I mean, get the discounts. The worst of this all, you have to look at this playlist. Dynamite. BTS. Happy Pharrell Williams. When I saw this, I fucking cried. Of course. Of course she listens to Imagine Dragons. Um, yeah, not even E45 could save my eyes because they were dry. Her whole coolness was slightly less problematic than Verity, I'd say. The only emotions I felt were indignance. What's the deal with all these letters saving the day? If this is the best, I'm really scared here comes the worst of the worst at the second to last rated book of all at 3.71 stars at 39.67 percent of reviews being critical without merit a book which leaves readers saying probably the most impressive thing about colleen hoover books is that every single one managed to mangle a different social issue by that standard this one is the most impressive of all because it mangles like eight of them <laughs> more on that in a bit should be illegal to read trigger warning says a hey, self-harm attempt mutilation recalled epilepsy she's a recall death of an elderly off page cheating od incest homophobia depression social anxiety disorder psychosis car accident brain tumor death of a pet touching a body serenic civil war recalled corruption recalled and implied ed 
I think we found the social issues, but let's read. Without merit is our young adult romance incestuous bulldozer of a book. Imagine being 17. Um, Your name is Merit and your whole vibe is I hate you, mom. And your mom was in a car accident and now has some sort of agoraphobia. So now she's in the basement all the time. You're just kind of like, I'm such a loser. I'm a virgin. Ha ha. Your twin sister you describe as a necrophiliac because apparently she just keeps on dating people people who are terminally ill and by the way her dad is an atheist i don't know why that was like super significant the whole plot is like merit battling her feelings of like i'm so emo and one day some random guy comes up to her and kisses her and because she's so much like i'm such a virgin she's like oh i really like this and it turns out that this boy is her twin sister's boyfriend who thought that she was the twin sister and he didn't know the twin sister sister was such twins this whole book is like her being like oh what would it be like to steal my twin sister's boyfriend oh Oh, i I really like the boyfriend but i can't make it obvious let me just wear my twin sister's night clothes and like just pretend to be her and he thinks i'm her and then i let's talk about the naming system um honor is the twin sister of merit they just need a distinction and a pass in the family Uh, but alas the brother is called utah the names colleen gives her characters are giving what i would probably name my family in sims 2 pets there's nothing significant about the pets that's just the only expansion pack that i had this is the only book where i'm like if this book is meant to be ya her writing style is a bit more forgivable in a sense, because it is meant to be YA, but it's slightly a bit too juvenile. I think that Colleen Hoover should be called Coincidence Hoover because the amount of coincidences that are required for her plot to go anywhere. Coincidence one, the guy who you kissed is the boyfriend of your sister that you barely talked to. Two, there's a part where she gives a random guy on the street a lift. She tells him, okay, I have a crush on my sister boyfriend i'm telling you because like i'm not gonna see you again um anyway where is the place that you wanted to be dropped off and he's like i don't know i'm visiting my sister i don't know the exact address but i have a photo and he shows the photo and he's like uh turns out that this random guy is the brother of the nurse victoria who is nursing after her mom victoria and the nurse victoria is now her stepmom because the dad piped the mom victoria's no, this random man is her uncle and now so she needs to drive back to her own house and now her uncle knows that she has a crush here are what i think the eight social issues are that the book touches upon and when i say touches upon i mean literally like mentioned or plot device depression the most obvious one literally mc gets handed an nhs do you have depression checklist and she's like damn maybe i'm depressed uh, to incest she really wants to lose her virginity and so she wants to lose it so bad that she's willing to um lose it to her step uncle You remember that random man that she gave a lift to? Uh, And it was very uncomfortable to read because she kind of wants it, but she's kind of really scared. So she kind of doesn't want it. And then, but don't worry, it ends up not happening last minute. um, So that's fine. Except, uh, oh wait, her brother actually piped the step from Cohen's dead. (laughs) S.A. This is a major spoiler, but we found out that Utah kissed Merritt when they were really young like 13 12 and because of that she's like become really depressed the reason why he did that is because he was trying to find out what his sexuality was which leads me on to four sexuality and homophobia unless your sexuality is like i like my own siblings i don't understand the purpose of including this as a plot device i feel like it just plays into this whole stereotype of like queer people are sexual deviants and i think once again colleen tries to use shock factor to make you think that this is a good book find out that this event has been what's been leading merit to depression and stuff but at the end it kind of they're like oh i'm sorry and she's like oh okay uh homophobia merit herself is homophobic there's just so many slut shaming there's so many weird homophobic comments um which i feel like is a pattern Uh, for example it's probably the whole gay thing you're experimenting with it's making you sentimental he glances back at me and narrows his eyes can't make gay jokes merit you aren't gay does being gay make you the gay authority on who can or can't tell gay jokes i'm not gay either he says could have fooled me i laugh if you don't think you're gay you're sexually confused Okay, bye, Phobia. Maybe he couldn't finish with me because he prefers Utahs. Not that I have anything against anyone being gay. (laughs) Oh, you said it. (laughs) 
it makes it all right then. Oh, for a second, I thought that you had like homophobic properties left. <laughs> Mary as a character, maybe top five worst characters ever I've ever read. I'm not even joking. Colleen plays on this whole depressed people are annoying as hell and they're so insufferable because she puts all those negative character traits into merit and i'm like i need to like at least one character in this whole goddamn book you know like you can't make me hate every single person the next social problem suicide stuff harm i think this quote just summarizes the whole essence of just how deeply these things are talked about really sagan you think i'll nick my wrist to pieces with a disposable bick do I need to talk about why that's just such an inappropriate comment? I get she's a teenager and maybe teenagers make inappropriate comments, but something in my intuition is telling me that like maybe that wasn't what it was supposed to be. Cheating, divorce, anxiety, uh, and the Syrian refugee crisis. I wish I was joking. We found out towards the end of the book that Sagan is actually half Syrian because of his Syrian opposition flag tattoo on his arm. There's a moment where he gives Merit a brief crash course history lesson on how the Syrian civil war started and talks about his own experience of being displaced from his family, how his mother was pregnant with his sister at the time, and his dad had visa issues and because of that he became separated and hasn't heard from them in seven years. To which Merit replies, I feel like an asshole while she's getting a with merit tattoo. Whilst the inclusion adds a breadth of wider stories outside of Colleen's usual Jeremy Kyle plot lines and, you know, acknowledges the rest of the world, when you're reading it, its mention feels oddly placed because not only is half of it a history lesson block of text for merit to realize that people outside of herself exist, but the fact that this interaction happens out of the blue towards the end of the book where he tells us this heartbreaking story about himself and then it just never gets mentioned at any other point ever again. It just felt like another issue she was trying to include but perhaps didn't fully explore. We don't even need to talk about plot. Basically, years of trauma gets resolved at the end uh, after a bit of chat. Should we go for chat? Points for Sagan's slender man drawings that he leaves around for Merit to find. Uh, minus points for letter writing. She writes this whole suicide note and then after that she's like, Sincerely, without Merit. I whisper to no one. That'll show him. And I think with so many weird family side plots, how did it end up being boring? How did that happen? And then we come to the worst of them all. At 3.65 stars, at 41.8% of all reviews being critical. That's nearly half of all the people that read it. Layla. You know where I draw the line when it comes to romances? At abuse and torture. Sigh. A book that makes people say, I don't fuck with ghosts like that. And another book that says, some men don't deserve rights. This book is a paranormal romance. Imagine ghosts, but instead you're a shitty ass bass player. And one day, you know what? Cut the crap. I can't, I can't be bothered to do that because this book was just... It was just pure shite. Leeds is our MC. He's so in love with this girl that he meets called Layla. I love her. Her drive. Her spontaneity. Her blow up. And then it cuts to another paragraph in the future where the same Layla is uh, tied up, struggling. And he's kind of doing an interview with someone about why she's tied up and shit. And then the MC goes, stop struggling. It'll be better for you. Which is why every single freaking serial killer ever says. And so from the beginning, I thought this man is a bad man, right? Like he tied, he tied someone up, right? He's the ma main character's bad guy, right? Right? Right. And so the whole point is to figure out like, why is Layla tied up? I thought he loved her. Let's rewind back a little bit. Leeds and Layla are on vacation. They're trying to spice up the relationship again. Because six months ago, Layla got shot by Leeds' stalker, jealous ex-girlfriend who tried to kill Layla. And Leeds was so angry that he killed the stalker. And since that day, Layla hasn't been herself. You know, she's tired. She's forgetful. She gets moved. And here's where the paranormal get comes into play. Lee starts noticing things are a little bit weird in the house. Things are moving around. Um, someone's leaving notes to me on my Word document. He turns to Reddit, r slash ghost, and he's like, guys, what, what's happening in my house? The short of it is, there's a ghost. And the ghost also possesses Layla part-time uh, and starts to communicate with Leeds. It's a friendly ghost. Some may say it's even a hot ghost. Why does this ghost know how to cook, how to use a cell phone and what an influencer is. There's a scene where the ghost goes swimming 
Anyway. So this ghost possesses Layla from time to time. And he's like, you know what? Let's call you Willow. And so because he liked Layla for her drive, her spontaneity, her blow. And because he's a man, he's like, Willow, I like your drive, your spontaneity. And I want some of that ghost. He wants the ghost coochie. So there's a part in this book where Willow possesses Layla. And then him, Willow, and Layla's unconscious body... I'm so disturbed by this man and by the fact that we're like, oh yeah, this is fine. Did he not love Layla enough to respect her? Like, and I guess it must have been a good time because he drugs Layla so that he can spend more time with Willow and they can Netflix and chill. But he's like, you know what? This is in the name of love. This is for your own good. So you think, all right, so this Willow character just has to like possess Layla more, right? But it's a Colleen Hoover book. So there's a twist. Uh, so I'm just gonna spoil it because I don't think anyone should read this. Like you can read the other ones if you want. It turns out this ghost Willow is a stalker ex. Or actually is Willow Layla because Layla and the stalker ex died at the same time. Their souls were like out and then maybe the stalker ex's soul got into Layla. So all this time you haven't really been into Layla because she's actually the stalker ex and the ghost Willow is Layla whose soul is like kind of battling inside her body actually. And the r slash reddit guy who answered your question who's doing the interview, he's a ghost as well. Oh, so my way out. It's just a shit paranormal. I feel like this is the book equivalent of this YouTube video. There was one too many ghosts. Yun was right. And yes, men do not deserve rights. We learned that the gap between Colleen's best and her worst might not be that wide. At her best, she's still offensive. There's still weird abuse shit going on. Uh, man, it's not great, but at least it's maybe mildly entertaining. And at her very worst, she's just all the ists and isms. This is another Hoover that I have beef with. I have 20 more of these to read. Make sure to subscribe and turn the bell notifications on to keep updated with this journey. I'll also be documenting it on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, I'm doing this for you.